Good morning, Harrisburg Brethren in Christ Church. Welcome to our service as we gather online today. We've been thinking together about the fruit of the Spirit, and this morning we'll be uh, focusing on faithfulness. Faithfulness begins with faith. Augustine said about faith, faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. In Luke 17, 5, the disciples uttered a simple yet profound, life-altering request to Jesus. They said, increase our faith. May that be our prayer this morning as we worship the Lord, as we lift up our hearts to him in praise, as we lift up our hearts to feed on his word and by it to learn and grow, as we lift up our hearts to him in surrender. I've been meditating in the last month or so on the words to an old hymn written in 1831, Oh, for a faith that will not shrink. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that will not murmur nor complain beneath the chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain will lean upon its God. A faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without, that when in danger knows no fear, in darkness feels no doubt. Lord, give me such a faith as this, and then whate'er may come, I'll taste even here the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. Let's pray. Increase our faith, Lord, as we open ourselves to you. Fill us to overflowing with your spirit. Bless our time of worship and bless our church as they join our gathering in their homes today. Increase our faith as we love and worship you. Increase our faith, Lord. Amen. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Lord, yes, I will. And I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out so yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name oh yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Lord, yes, I will for all my days. Lord, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. So yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy. When my heart is heavy all my days, Lord, yes, I will. Yes, I will 
lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Lord, yes, I will for all my days. Lord, yes, I will for all my days. Lord, yes, I will. This morning's children's story is going to be brought to us by Pastor Bree's husband, Mr. Steve, and their children. It's a story about faithfulness from the Bible. Enjoy. Our story today is one of faithfulness and friendship. We join our friends, Jonathan and David, living in King Saul's house. At this point, David has been anointed by Samuel to rule God's people, leaving Saul with a spirit that is tormenting him. I'm so tormented. Today, David, today I make a covenant with you. Have these items as a sign of that covenant. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I'm just to have you have your friendship. Now Saul tried to kill David several times, but each time Jonathan came to the defense of his friend David, questioning his father as to what wrong did David do. The day before the new moon feast, David asked his friend Jonathan to help again. If your father asks where I'm at, tell him I have gone to Bethlehem to make a sacrifice for him. For my my whole claim, if he responds, say it very well. Then I I know I'm safe. But if he loses temple, then te then then you know he wants to harm me. Now now will you tell me and tell me if he answers harshly? Here's what I'll do: hide in that bush over there and I will come with my servant boy. I will shoot three arrows. If they land next to you, then then you are safe. If I tell the boy the arrows are beyond, then you must go. So David and Jonathan put their plan into action and as David thought, Saul wasn't happy. Who is David? He, he is in Bethlehem making a special sacrifice for his clan. I'm so angry! <laughs> no! David tried to kill Jonathan. The next day, Jonathan goes out to the field to meet David. Arriving at the field, he has he has the servant boy help him. Go, go run and find the arrows I shoot. Come up the hill. Good job. Here, Wesley, get around. Wesley, get around. Wesley, get around. Wesley. See, are they here? I'm here. I'm here. They are beyond you. Go run behind Anthony. Go hide. <laughs> With go. this, David knew he must go. Jonathan and David gave each other one last hug, and Jonathan told him to go in peace. Go in peace. This story is a nice reminder of what it means to be a faithful friend. Jonathan, like Saul, could have easily been jealous, but instead remained by David's side. There may be times in life when we are David, and it's a blessing to have a friend like Jonathan. In other times, we get to be a Jonathan, cheering on our friends, standing by them faithfully as they grow. Friends who are faithful support each other no matter what. We've come to the portion of our service where we're going to where we would take an offering and we're going to pray for donations again i remind you that if you don't know how to give you can turn to the website and there in the upper right hand corner you can press a button and it will show you the various ways to give would you please join with me now in prayer most gracious jesus we thank you lord we thank you lord that during these days we are reminded of certain basics and one is that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the, of the preciousness of human life. Lord, when I read in science books how 
more is going on in the human body than the rest of the universe combined, I certainly am reminded of how precious our existence is. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your kindness. Thank you, Lord, that you think of us always and that we are made in your image. Thank you, Lord, for food on the table and shelter. Thank you for family and friends. And most of all, thank you for Jesus, who made a way where there was no way and brought us eternal life. Lord, we pray that we can pass on this goodness and kindness and faithfulness. Lord, help us to feed those who are hungry now through our food pantry. Help us to minister those who, who need some money through our deacon's fund. Lord, help us with people who are lonely to give them our friendship. Lord, and we pray, we pray deeply that this coronavirus, that a cure will come and that this plague will end. Lord, also our hearts are heavy by what we're seeing on television. We are seeing, Lord, again, the sin of racism a sin that was there at the foundation of this country and a sin that has never left us. Lord, I pray for the grieving families. I pray that you minister and Lord, I pray that we as a church can teach and model conciliation, there it, that we can tell the world there is a better way than what is going on here. Lord, I also pray for justice. I pray, Lord, that these things that we have seen will not be swept under the carpet and that, Lord, justice will roll down like a mighty river. Father, we as a church who are diverse and working at it, we, we again, our hearts are broken. Help us to speak out. Help us to share with family and friends and with politicians and others. Help us, Lord, to stand for your values of the kingdom. Lord, forgive this nation. And Lord, I pray really that you forgive so many white Christians who will ignore this, who will justify this, who live segregated lives and simply don't, or simply don't care about this. Lord, awaken your church, awaken all of your church, and help us, Lord, to love like you love, and help us to be faithful to our brothers and sisters of color. Help us, Lord, to represent the family of God. Now bless this offering. Bless it so your name may be spread, so that your kingdom may come in its fullness, so that we may minister. Bless this offering, Lord, so that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, now it's time for our congregational prayer, and I just can't wait for the day where we can all get together and sing the doxology together. I was just thinking about that when we were sitting back there. All right, let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you, God. We praise you, God, and worship you, Father. You alone are glorified, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 God. Father, we just thank you, God. We thank you, God, for what you're doing, my God, even now, Lord. Even if we cannot see, my God, in your hand, my God is upon it all, Lord. Jesus, God. Father, we want to trade yokes with you, God. We want to trade burdens with you, Lord. I want to encourage you that if you have um, a burden or something heavy that's on you, this is the time where you're just going to let it out. If you need to press pause because you have to go longer than I go, I want you to feel free to press pause and get back when you're done. Um, there's so much more happening than corona. This is a good time to stop and let it all out. He's waiting. Father, we just thank you, God. We lift up all, every burden, every thought, every concern, every worry, every anxiety, Lord, every fear, every disappointment, every disillusionment. Lord, we bring it to you, God. We bring it to you, God. You are our peace, our rock, our fortress, our shelter in the time of need, God.
It is in you, God, that we can hide, God. It's in you, God, where we can find safety. It's in you, God, where we can find healing. It's in you, God, that we can trust, Lord. Jesus, God. Father, I just thank you, God, for the work that you are doing, Lord. I thank you, God, that it will be evident, Lord, that we would not only see it hindsight, looking back at our lives, Lord, but we will see your hand in real time moving, Father. I thank you, God, that the things that you are putting in place, my God, is for a better tomorrow, Lord. I thank you, Father, that even now, Lord, that we can expect something big and great for you, God, that you are the God of all impossibilities, Lord. That we may not see, God, how you see things, God, that we may not think how you think, Lord, but your ways are higher, your thoughts are better, God. And we trust in that, God. We trust in you, God. We trust in your goodness and your faithfulness, God. Your consistency, Lord. Father, we thank you, God, that you have, consist you have been consistently faithful to us, Lord. And we can rest on that. We can rest, my God, on your faithfulness, on your goodness, on your love, God, on your mercy, on your justice, your righteousness, your holiness. We can rest on who you are, God, because you are unchanging. Father, I thank you, God, for the time of Pentecost, Lord. I thank you, God, that your spirit is now upon all men who believe, God, all women who believe in you, God, that we can now, my God, tap into your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you, God, for the evidence, God, of your Holy Spirit to be upon your church, God, that we would move boldly and courageously, Lord, that we would not hold back, God, that we would be speaking truth into situations, my God. Father, Jesus said, my God, that we would raise the dead and heal the sick and stomp on devil's heads, Lord, that we will walk in that authority, Lord, that you, God, have given to us, Lord. That we would allow ourselves to be used by you like never before, God. Help us, Lord, to do your will even today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Before the sermon this morning, I'm overjoyed to share with you um, a poem that is actually entitled Prophets of a Future Not Our Own. This was written by Ken Utner of Saginaw, and it was dedicated to um, fallen priests, but specifically it's been dedicated to Archbishop Oscar Romero, who's a priest from El Salvador, and he is someone who was actually killed giving mass. Uh, Romero is one of my um, heroes of the faith, if you will. He gave his life loving the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, and and he was actually assassinated during um, a service. Horacia is one of the young adults in our church. She's grown up here. It's been a joy to see the woman that she's growing into. And I'm very, very excited to share this with you. This prayer was first presented by Cardinal Dearden in 1979 and quoted by Pope Francis in 2015. This reflection is an excerpt from a homily written for Cardinal Dearden by then for Ken Utender on the occasion of the Mass for Deceased Priests October 25th, 1979. Prophets of a future not our own. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. 
Good morning and welcome. Uh, we're so glad you're joining us this morning. One of the joys and blessings of the technology we have is that we are um, gifted the opportunity to worship together locally, regionally, and even around the world. So hello from wherever you're sitting this morning. We're so glad you're with us. Um, speaking of being a chance to worship globally, this Sunday uh, is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is when the church around the world celebrates Jesus's fulfillment of the Holy Spirit coming down. Jesus had promised the helper for his disciples. Um, he had promised that the Holy Spirit would come and indwell in them. After Jesus ascends to heaven, the Holy Spirit baptizes the people of God for the kingdom work. The church is born on the day of Pentecost, and it's a reminder that the church is God of every nation, every tribe, every tongue. The diverse people who had gathered in Jerusalem were able to hear the word of God clearly in their own language, and the church is birthed to go all over the known world at the time. But Pentecost is also a reminder that our God is faithful. And that's what we want to talk about this morning, faithfulness. We're going to be continuing through our sermon series, growing series, looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Again, we've always based this in John 15, and Jesus is teaching there that he is the vine and his Father God is the gardener, and we are the branches. Jesus commands us that if we obey his commandments, we could remain in him. If we remain in him, we live by the Spirit. If we remain in him and live by the Spirit, we bear fruit. Fruit for us, then, is simply living and loving like Christ. And that fruit looks like the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 puts it like this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The challenge for us during this time has been, how are we growing in this season? How are we remaining in the vine that is Jesus Christ? How are we growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Again, specifically this morning, we'll be talking about faithfulness. Um, faithfulness is a word that I grew up hearing a lot. I grew up in the church, and it was God is faithful. We who believe in God are supposed to be faithful. We were even called the faithful a couple times in Scripture. Um, faithfulness, when I first understood it, was just a basic breakdown of the word, right? I was like, full of faith. That's what's faithfulness. But what is indeed faith? Hebrews 11 says this, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. So when we talk about faithfulness, we talk about how our God protects, how our God gives us mercy, how our God loves, and how our God works together for our good. Faithfulness is trust and reliance on God. Faithfulness is God's essence. He is true. He is loyal. He is constant. He is reliable. Faithfulness is also the fruit of what God does because he is faithful to fulfill all his promises to us. And faithfulness, lastly, is God's call to us. We're called to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. We're called to follow Jesus Christ. And then we're called to live and love like Jesus. Us. To highlight our story this morning on faithfulness, we're going to be looking at Ruth, uh, one of my heroines of the faith, if you will. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, I will be reading the chapter in its entirety, starting at verse 1. In the days when judges ruled, there was famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kalion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left with her two sons, without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you and to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then give birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord has turned his hand against me. 
At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told, me. She told them. Call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you this morning that you are indeed faithful. Lord, we thank you that you work together for our good. We thank you that you guide us, that you protect us, that you hold us. Lord, we thank you that your mercies are indeed new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God, we praise you, we worship you, we give our lives to you, for you love us. Thank you for your faithfulness. In your holy and precious name, amen. The book of Ruth is a story of strong women. The book of Ruth is a story about widows. The book of Ruth is a story about immigrants. Author Karen Gonzalez, who's also an immigrant advocate, says, the book of Ruth it teaches us that God sees the immigrant, but God also works to change their destiny. Our passage is the beginning of the book in the first chapter, and it begins in the time of the judges. So this is before Israel establishes kings. Um, some contemporaries feel like this time was specifically the time of Jephthah and Samson, if you're reading in the book of uh, Judges, but what we know for sure is it's the time of Judges, and famine strikes the land, and there's a little bit of irony here, because Bethlehem, where our principal characters are from, literally means the house of bread, and yet famine strikes the land, and they're forced to flee, and our principal characters that we meet is Elimelech, the patriarch of the family, Elimelech, his name actually means my God is king, and he's from Bethlehem, Judah, which the author repeats time and time again to show us that he's not just uh, uh, an Israelite, but he's a Jew of all Jews. He's from Bethlehem, Judah. And his wife, Naomi, her name means my delight or, or the pleasant one. And they have two sons, the sons of Malon and Kilion. Now, I don't know what the, who made the idea to name these children, but you know Bible stories, the names kind of tell your destiny a little bit. And Malon actually means sick, and Kilion means wasting away. So I don't know who made the decision to name their children that, but that's what they were named, sick and wasting away. Malon and, and Kilion. But one of the things that's important about the story of Ruth is that this is an immigrant story. You know, you have to remember the relationship between Israel and Moab. For the people, for Elimelech to take his family, to take his wife and his two sons, to move to Moab was a desperate situation. And it's a reminder to us that when immigrants come on our shores, it's a desperate situation. Whatever, wherever they're living has become so untenable that they need not just a new life, but they want freedom and a chance at life. And why is all this important? It's because Moab would be the last place that a true Israelite would want to go. Moab is actually born from Lot's incest with his daughters. Moab was, so, um, was, was such a cursed place when it came to the Jews that actually the, the commandments in the Torah said, for 10 generations, you are not allowed. If you're a Moabite, you have to be separated by 10 plus generations before you could ever enter Israelite worship. Moab was even banned from, from, from being married into. So again, we have this family that's, that's a very Jewish family from Bethlehem, Judah. And when famine strikes the land, they're so desperate that they have to go to the hated Moab, the place that they were supposed to have nothing to deal with. And it's a reminder to us that when immigrants show up on our shore, often it's not their first choice. They want to be home, but it's a last resort. So they get to Moab and they settle down. Well, after a little while, Elimelech dies. The sons grow up, and, and, and Malon and, and Kilion, they marry two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And they go for 10 years, a full decade, and during that time, no sons were born. 
So you have the maladies stacking up. We have famine that caused them to leave their land. We have them have the patriarch of the family dies. The sons grow up and, and because they're in Moab, they marry Moabite women. And after they marry Moabite women for 10 years, they have no children. So this is also a story of infertility. This is a story of struggling. Being in that culture, having children was your, not just destiny, having children was your livelihood to not only pass on the family name, but to ensure that you had someone to take care of you as you age. And for 10 years, both Ruth and Orpah, Malon and Kilion, neither union brought children. And then the sons die. And Naomi is left With these two daughters now, no sons, no husband. But then God's faithfulness shows up. Somehow, in this land of Moab, Ruth and Naomi and Orpah get word that there's now food back home in Bethlehem. And I love that. What a reminder that no matter how hard life seems, no matter how desperate it seems, the work of God will find our ears if we learn how to listen. And the word has spread that there's food back in in Bethlehem, there's food back in Judah. So Naomi says, okay, let's gather our things, let's go home. And when she's on the road back to Judah, it hits her, I'm old. Even if I were to remarry and have a son, you know, this son can't grow up and and, and two sons can't grow up and marry both of you. You're still young. Why don't you go back home? And it's interesting that she doesn't send them home to their fathers. You know, in that culture, it wasn't just a patriarchal society, but in that culture, it became then the job of the male members to not only secure, you know, a bride, but to secure their future. And, and so, but she doesn't send them to the fathers. She actually says, go back to your mothers. And, and, and in essence, she's encouraging them to go and get that love that she can no longer give to them and to go and prepare for another wedding. And Orpah and Ruth say no. They're like, no, you're our mother. We love you. We will go back to you. And there's a really cool line in there where she says, no, 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 go back home. And I pray that God will show you kindness. The Hebrew word there is hesed. And she's saying, I'm praying that this God who may have deserted me may be faithful to you. I'm praying that this God will work together all things for your good. I'm praying that this God will give you mercies new every morning while you're back home in Moab. And and the women weep and they say no. And finally, Orpah says, you know what? Let's try it. And Orpah goes home. But Ruth is clear. Ruth is determined. Ruth is loyal. Ruth is faithful. And Ruth utters some of the most familiar words in all of Scripture. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and my, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. Ruth is faithful. She's faithful to the point of, yes, my husband is gone, but Naomi, you are now my family. Ruth assumes leadership here because she says, your people are now my people. Where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. You know, one of the greatest worries in that culture was that as you age, there would be no one to take care of you. As you die, there would be no one to prepare for you. And Ruth binds herself to Naomi forever, not knowing the future. And you can even argue, not even really knowing this God, but just learning more and more about God. And what I love about Ruth's faithfulness is that she is willing to stand on the side of the oppressed here, the marginalized here, because Naomi now is a widow. Naomi has no husband. Naomi has no sons. Naomi is going back empty, as she says. Yet Ruth promises to stay with her. And what a homecoming they have. You know, a lot of us who are maybe not, who are immigrants to these shores, We dream of homecoming. We dream of going to the land where we were born. And when we dream of going back to that land where we were born, you picture celebration, seeing family and friends you haven't seen for years and maybe decades. Naomi dreads it. And when the people are excited to see her, she says, why are you excited? God has forsaken me. God has taken me, Naomi, and made me Mara. And it's significant. Naomi means pleasant one or pleasantness. And she says, my life is bitter. 
But it's God's faithfulness even in the name she chooses. Because in the Old Testament, uh, a couple generations before, when the Israelites are saved from Egypt, when they're walking through the wilderness, they actually come to a place called Mara, for the waters were bitter. And they murmured and they complained about God forsaking them. Yet God calls Moses to take a tree and to throw a tree into the water, and the water is then made good enough to drink, and the people are also led to Elam, which is a place of not just water, but shade from the sun. So I love that even in her bitterness, God had a memory for the people who would be listening to this story. They would hear, yes, she's had a hard life, but if God named her, if she was willing to name herself Mara, the story doesn't end with bitterness. And I love that story of Mara because a lot of people believe it's a picture of what Jesus did for us. That we were so far away from God that we could not get to God on our own. But the tree that was thrown into the water wasn't thrown into the water. It was the hill that Jesus died. And on Calvary's tree, our bitter waters are made sweet. Jesus gives us abundant life through his sacrifice. So even in her bitterness, even in her not feeling God working, the listeners would hear Mara and they'd be like, well, you might be bitter now, but how does the story end? And I love that the writer gives us a little clue because the story ends with this little lion. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Life has been hard. They've lost husbands. They've lost livelihoods. They probably think they've lost futures. They don't know what's going to happen. They're going home empty. But of all the times to re-enter Judah, they enter at the time of the harvest. Moabite, Ruth, the immigrant. Naomi, who's coming home but has been gone for a while. And this is why this is significant that they came for the harvest, because you see God's faithfulness here. The law says this in Deuteronomy. Do not deprive the foreigner or the immigrant or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak from the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. This is why I command you to do this. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner and the immigrant. Leave it for the fatherless and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your work and with all your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner and the immigrant, for the fatherless and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner and the immigrant, the fatherless and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. This is why I command you to do this. It is not a coincidence that they show up at the time of the harvest. That's how God's faithfulness works. They show up And the law that is baked into the people's psyche and the reality that they live in was that God provides for the immigrant. God provides for the widow. God provides for the marginalized. And even though they were going back to what they thought was nothing, they were going back to plenty. And the rest plays out in the story about all the ways God provides. You know, I've been thinking about faithfulness this week. And when we think about faithfulness in this whole season, we've been saying, how are we to grow? How are we to grow? Like plants need water and nutrients and air. How are we to grow? How are we to be fed by God? How are we to submit to the Spirit? What is this community that we're putting ourselves in? And how healthy is it? Is it pushing us towards Christ? Are we keeping our eyes on Jesus, knowing that Jesus keeps his eyes on us? When I think about faithfulness, I thought about these four things this week. It really is the essence of who God is. The writer of Hebrews 12 in chapter 12 says, Jesus is the pioneer of our faith. The old translation says he's the author and finisher of our faith. And when I think about faithfulness, no matter what your situation, you may not be Naomi this morning. You may not be Ruth this morning. You may not even be Orpah this morning. But whatever situation you're in, God is faithful. It is the essence, the core of who he is. God is providing. God is working. God has promised to not leave you or forsake you. God has promised to work all things for your good. God has promised new mercies to you every morning, for great is his faithfulness. So the question to us is, yes, God is faithful, but do we trust him? 
Do we trust God in this? Whatever this is for you this morning, do you trust God? Do you trust God in this? And I found this might be the question of my life. No matter what happens, God seems to be asking me, so I'm asking you on his behalf consistently, do you trust God? Do you trust God in this? Because faithfulness is the essence of who God is. Do you trust him? Do you trust him now in this? Faithfulness is also the fruit of what God does. I love that the God we serve, the God we worship, the God we bow down to is the God who sees us. Remember the story of Hagar. Hagar was a a slave, an immigrant, a foreigner who got pregnant because Abraham and Sarah abused their power. And, And then they abused her. And things were so bad that even when she was pregnant, about to give birth, she was so fed up with them that she ran away from them into the desert. A pregnant woman about to give birth had a life that was so terrible with Abraham and Sarah that she ran into the desert sun. But yet on that journey, God shows up and God says, Hagar, I am the God who sees you. And that's also the story of Ruth, that she was a Moabite. She was going to be a stranger and an immigrant. She was going to be someone that the Israelites didn't like, wanted nothing to do with. But God welcomes her home as a daughter. God makes provision that she would be provided for. God gives fruit because of her faith. And Ruth, this Moabite, this stranger, this immigrant, this outsider, gets to be the great-grandmother of Israel's greatest king. But more than that, she gets to be in the genealogy of God's son, Jesus Christ. God sees the immigrant, and God changes their destiny because of faith in him. And faithfulness, then, is loving like God. God has a heart for the stranger, the immigrants, the least of these, the oppressed among us. Leviticus 19, also in the Old Testament law, says it like this. When a foreigner, an immigrant, resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God not only loves the marginalized, the immigrants, the least of these. God reminds us that we were once ostracized from him, that we were once because of our sin on the outside looking in, that we were once far away. And for Israel, he called them back to Egypt. For Jesus, he'll call us back to the cross because Jesus died for you. Love the least of these. Love the immigrants. Look to your Jesus. Look to your God. Be faithful to them for God loves them. God loves the oppressed. Our our, our hearts are very heavy this morning. In our country this week, we found out about a man by the name of George Floyd who was killed due to injuries suffered by police violence. And there's a lot of us who see stories like this, and it's more than stories. We don't have to do a lot of mental gymnastics or backflips to say, this could be me, this could be my sister, this could be my mother, this could be my cousin, this could be my son, this could be my daughter. And we have to remind ourselves as Christians That when people are being oppressed, our God is on the side of the oppressed. When people are being killed, our God is hearing their blood cry out for his justice. When people are being systematically mistreated by any kind of institution, God is not on the side of that institution or that country. In our city of Harrisburg, in our region, we're also grieving this week the loss of a 14-year-old boy to gun violence, 14 years old, and his life is snuffed out from him. We as a church, we as Christians, have to start going where God goes, working not just at the margins, but standing with the oppressed. Because our God loves people. Our God loves all his children. And when people are dying and hurting, God wants us not on the side of power, but on the side of justice. In the Old Testament, being faithful like God is faithful is the call. In the New Testament, being faithful like Jesus is faithful is the call. In the Old Testament, God gives law to protect the immigrants, the oppressed, the widows, the least of these. In the New Testament, 
Jesus leaves the Spirit, and Jesus leaves you the church. And Jesus reminds us through the words of his good friend John, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. When we have marginalized people among us, when we have oppressed people with us, may we be reminded of Ruth, that God sees the oppression, that God sees the outsider, and God works on their behalf. And God has now left us to be voice for the voiceless, to live as the actual body of Christ. To not just say, oh, that's terrible what's happening there, but to say this is happening to us for everyone who believes and belongs to Jesus Christ is our sister and is our brother, and everyone is made in the image of God, so they're our sister and our brother. God is calling us to be faithful to not just the body of Christ, but to each other. Horatio read that poem, Prophets of a Future Not Our Own. And there's a line in here that gives me great hope, four lines really. And it's this reminder of the work we are to do. And the lines are simply this, and they play so well in this our growing season. It's a reminder to us of why we must stand with the marginalized, the oppressed. Why we must stand with the immigrants, for God sees them. And God is working for them, and God is changing their destiny, and he's left us to join the work. And, and the, the poem reads like this. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and we, the worker. We are workers, not master builders. We are ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Our God has called us to be prophets, to be sisters and brothers of a future that may not be our own in this life. But all of us are called to plant seeds that one day will grow, to find where God is already working and moving and water seeds that they may grow. All of us are called not to solve all the world's problems, but to work, but to work, and to work on behalf of each other. So when we remember Ruth this week, remember her faithfulness to Naomi, her faithfulness to God, may we be reminded that God is working and the invitation is for us to join in. God bless you. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your Great is your faithfulness to me. Oh, though the seasons change, God, you remain the same. And God, from age to age, Though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove, there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come 
want to remind you of a few announcements for this week. Next Sunday at 9 a.m. we will have our live service. It will be a live service but it will be on Zoom. Please watch for the link and join us for a communion service together. Be sure to have your bread and juice for your household ready. Thank you for your donations for My Coins Count. We were able to send $1,107.77 to them which is phenomenal so thank you for that. Please join us for our many Zoom connections. There are times for children, youth, young adults, seniors, discipleship, Bible study, and just connecting. Uh, the children's ministry uh, is sponsoring family fishing at the Cutman's Pond next Saturday and Sunday in the late afternoon. There are still a few openings, so we are inviting anyone from the church to join us for a fun time. We will be using safe distancing. Also, um, please take time to look over the Journeying Together While Apart email for more information and other announcements. If you are not getting that email, please let the church office know and we will add you to that distribution list. Thank you and have an awesome week. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail. As thou hast been, how forever. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have needed I have provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses of love. Join with all nations.
victory valley for witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Oh, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. In pardon for sin, and a peace that endures thine own dear presence to cheer and to God strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings on mine with ten thousand take their young sons, Malan and, and Kilion, and they flee all the day they, from all they know to this land of Moab that was big and scary and that they were supposed to have nothing to do with, but because they were so desperate, they flee, and God is faithful to save them from famine. Naomi and Ruth suffer unbelievable human loss. They lose husbands, there is no heir, there is no, seemingly no future, but God is faithful to tell them of his work of bringing food um, back in Bethlehem. When they enter into the city of Bethlehem, the people rejoice at their greeting, and even though they feel empty and without anything, God had made the law that they would be provided for. God sees them. What a blessing this morning that our God is faithful, that our God works together for our good. Even when we don't feel it, he's working, that our God is the one who's on our side, that our God sees us. Whatever you're going through, God is working for your good. Whatever you feel or don't feel, God is on your side. Our God is faithful. Our God is good. Our God is true. Let's give thanks through prayer. Father, our God, we thank you so much this morning that you are indeed faithful. God, we thank you that it is you we can rely upon. It is you who sees us. It is you who works for us. It is you who works in us and works through us. God, like you are faithful, you've called us to be faithful. So we pray now as your people that we can work to give our voice to the voiceless, that we can stand with the marginalized and the oppressed, and that we can be faithful to one another as you have always been faithful to us. God, bless us and keep us. Holy Spirit, empower us and make us in the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to keep partnering with you to bring your love into our world. In your holy and precious name, amen. God bless you all. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail. As thou hast been, thou forever 
Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me. 